can we trust Jesus? Can we trust Jesus? Is he going to keep his words? Since Romans chapter 9, we've, Paul has really been pressing home the truth that Jesus' family is not about race or morality or power or privilege, but about one thing, about faith in Jesus. And to make this point really clear, Paul speaks about Israel. He speaks about how Israel had rejected Jesus, how they killed the prophets, these men and women who would preach the gospel to Israel. And so they don't actually know God. And they are not saved. And so for the Jewish Christian in Rome who is reading this letter, the question might be on their mind, well, hang on. Does that mean that God's finished with Israel then? Has he changed his mind about Israel? Because if we go all the way back to Abraham, we see that God promises to bless Abraham's family. Do you remember, boys and girls, that story about Jesus coming alongside Abraham and stargazing together and telling him that his children will be as many as the stars in the sky? And then God repeats his promise to Isaac, um, sorry, to Abraham's son, Isaac. And then he repeats it again to Isaac's son, Jacob. And then God changes Jacob's name to Israel. And after that point, everyone in Jacob's family is known by the name Israel. This family is called Israel. And so the promises that have been made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, the promise has been that Israel will be saved. But as we come back to Romans, we ask, how can this be? Because Paul is saying that being saved is not about being part of Abraham's line. It's not about being part of Abraham's genetic offspring. So, does that mean God's changed his mind? This might seem like a, an academic question, but really it's not. It's a very practical, applied question. Because really the question we're asking is, is God faithful? Does God keep his promises? Does he keep his promises to the people he's made those promises to? Or does he change his mind? And that is a really important question. Boys and girls, I wonder if you can imagine, if, um, imagine, this isn't happening, but if your parents turned around to you and said, right, for Christmas, we're going to Disneyland. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine how excited you'd be? You'd be counting down the days and you'd be thinking, yes, Christmas holidays come, we're going to Disneyland. How then would you feel if on the first day of your Christmas holidays, mum and dad turn around and go, yeah, actually, we're going to take the kids from next door and not you. Can you imagine? We're not going to take you to Disneyland, we're going to take Bob and Sarah from next door. How distraught would you be? That's not what good parents do, is it? They don't tell you one thing and do another. They don't promise you one thing and then not do it. And you wouldn't trust them again in the future, would you? Is that what God has done with Israel? Did he promise them something and then at the last minute change his mind? Verse 1, Paul says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. Not at all says Paul. God keeps his promises to his people. And so Paul writes chapter 11 because he wants us to be confident that God is faithful, that he keeps his promises. He wants us to know what God is like. And so he answers what is the key theological question at the heart of this issue. It's a question that's been rumbling on since chapter 9. The question is, who is Israel? Who is Israel? Who is it? Who is this group of people who God has made these promises to? And this is a really important question. And it's a question that has caused lots of confusion and conflict in the church. But it's also a question, actually, it's called confusion and conflict 
on the world stage as well. It's really important we understand this word Israel. I wonder what you think about when you hear the word Israel. If we asked the, the general public, if we went down to Halifax and we just said, what do you think about when you think of Israel? I'm sure most people would probably think of uh, modern day states of Israel and the polit political conflict that surrounds it. Maybe that's what we think of. Uh, perhaps if we're, if we're familiar with the Bible, if we've, if we've read uh, any of it, maybe when we hear the word Israel, we think of you know, that, that first half of the Bible. You know, the, uh, the Old Testament stories of Israel. Perhaps the word Israel conjure up this idea of an ancient people uh, who God once upon a time had dealings with, but really Israel's got nothing to do with me today. But what Paul's going to show us is that actually the word Israel should be a really precious word to everyone who believes in the gospel. Because actually, for everyone who believes in the gospel, it is our identity. We are Israel. The first thing that should come into our minds when we hear the word Israel is the worldwide family of Christian believers. That's what we should think about when we hear the word Israel, the worldwide family of Christian believers. In other words, the church. Let's look at what Paul's saying here. So Paul answers this imaginary and yet very real question, has God rejected his people, by saying, obviously not. And the answer that he gives to that is, well, obviously not, because I'm saved, aren't I? I'm Jewish. I'm a Jew among Jews, he says elsewhere. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I've kept all the, I've kept all the laws. Obviously, God hasn't rejected all of Abraham's descendants because here I am. And really, that could be the end of the matter, couldn't it? Obviously, he hasn't. Look, I'm here. But Paul knows that a bit more explanation is needed. And so, where does Paul turn once again to answer this question? He turns to the Old Testament to show that this is the way it's always been. Uh, boys and girls, and all of us, I cannot stress enough, if you want to understand your Bible, if you want to understand the Bible, you need to understand the Old Testament. The Old Testament is where all the theology of the Bible comes from. You'll never really understand the New Testament until you have a grasp of the Old Testament. That's where all the theology of the Bible is. The Old Testament is the, the powerhouse of our understanding. And, and really what we find in the New Testament is just lots of people doing Bible studies on the Old Testament. Explaining what's already there and helping us to understand it. And so Paul goes there again. And he writes about Elijah this time. He says in verse 2, Do you know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appeals against the God of Israel, uh, sorry, appeals to God against Israel. Paul's saying, guys, this question's nothing new. This question's been asked for hundreds of years. In Elijah's day, there was a concern about how few Israelites actually trusted in Jesus, trusted in the Christ. Elijah says, God. Israel, your people, they, they've killed the prophets who preached about you. They have abandoned the faith. I think I'm the only one left who follows you, Lord. What does the Lord say to Elijah? Oh no, Elijah. Don't, don't worry. I've kept 7,000. You may not see them, Elijah. And they may seem like a, such a small number compared to how many there are. But I have kept some. I have held them tight. I have held tight those who trust in me. And Paul applies those words to now in verse 5. And he says, so too, at the present time, there is a remnant. There is a, there is a small amount who are chosen by grace. This is really, really beautiful. God says, Israel, this nation... And, and Israel's descendants might reject my messengers. They may ignore my words. They may defy my commandments. And they can even crucify my son. But I will still love them. 
Why? Because they're chosen by grace. It's not about what they do. It's not about what they've done. I will never completely reject them as a people. There are still those amongst them who are my people, who love me and love my son, and I will never reject them. I will never despise them because of their ancestors. God is faithful to Israel's descendants, even though many, if not most, have turned away from him. He will keep some. He will show his love and his grace, verse 6, for it is by grace. It is not on the basis of works, otherwise grace would not be grace. You see, what this says to us is that we can know that God will always be faithful because his actions towards us, his love towards us, is always based on his character and not on ours. The way he acts towards us is never about what we have done, but about who he is. And he is love, and he is grace, and he is mercy. And so we can trust that he is unchanging in that, and that he set his love upon us. God never turned around to the whole Jewish people and said, you're not good enough, I cannot possibly have any of you in my family, I'm checking out, deals off. He never said that. God has set his love upon a people and they are made up of Jew and Gentile and none of them, none of us, deserve his love. God will be well within within his rights to to cast us off because we've all defied him, we've all broken his rules, we've all turned our back on him, ignored him, despised him, killed him and yet God sets his love upon people just like us. He comes to us and he changes our hearts of stone for hearts of flesh and he he sets his spirit upon us and he breathes spiritual life into us. And this is the way it's always been. Right from Cain and Abel through Jacob and Esau and beyond, God has shown his grace. It has never been about keeping the law. It was always about trusting in Jesus. There have always been descendants of Jacob who did not trust Jesus and so are not his people and there will always be those who do. And so we begin to build an answer to this question, who is Israel? Answer, well, Israel is that family of people who trust Jesus. Remember what Paul said in chapter 9, he said, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Not all who come from him are actually Israel. It's not about that. We get another Old Testament quote in verse 8 here. This time it's from Isaiah chapter 29. And both Paul and Isaiah are both saying the same thing. They're basically saying, you can't reject the gospel, you can't reject Jesus with impunity. Rejecting the gospel always has consequences and so verse 8 the consequences were God gave them a spirit of stupor eyes that could not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day he's saying there are those who they'll never see they will never hear what is the cause of this hardening well if you go to Isaiah 29 and you read the whole chapter you see that Isaiah continues and this is really interesting when we think about what we were learning about last week Because what Isaiah says, this people whose eyes have been closed and whose ears have been closed, they are a people who drew near me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their heart was far from me. What did we see last week? We saw that saving faith, true faith, is to confess Jesus with our mouths, but only after our hearts have first been convinced of that truth. And here, God says, I have finally hardened them because they have first hardened themselves. They they say all sorts of lovely things about me with their mouth. They sing songs to me. They pray to me. They pay lip service to knowing me. But their hearts, who they really are and what they really love, has nothing to do with me. They are far away from me. That is not what my people are like. 
So does that mean that Israel are the nation of Israel is a hopeless case? Verse 11, not at all. Israel's hardening fits into a much bigger plan. Just as the hardness of Pharaoh led to a display of God's power, so now the hardness of the Jews, well, what has it led to? It's led to the worldwide spread of the gospel. What we see is that God is not stumped by our human rebellion. We can't get in his way. In fact, God uses the rebellion of Israel, not only for the good of the whole world, but for the good of the nation of Israel. Do you see that in verse 11? As the Gentiles are are welcomed into the blessings that the Israelites had, uh, they'd been offered for centuries, Israel should become jealous. And they should say, like, those are our blessings. We will become Christians so that we can have them. Salvation of the Jews is something that all believers should rejoice in. Verse 12 says that if the rebellion of the Jews against Jesus has caused the worldwide spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth, just imagine the immensity of gospel blessing if all the Jews believed the gospel. If these people who had been set aside from Abraham, if they actually believed. Imagine the glory that would be given to God and the potential for worldwide gospel impact if a whole nation repented and followed Jesus. If they began following the one who their first father, Abraham, had trusted in and walked with all those hundreds of years before. And Paul makes it clear that actually that is possible in verse 16. Because verse 16 might sound a little bit strange. What does it say? It says, if the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. What Paul is saying is actually very simple. He is saying that if some of Israel, this small part of Israel, has become a Christian, well, there's no reason why the whole of Israel can't become a Christian. Because the gospel is offered to them as well. Nobody is banned from hearing the gospel and turning to Jesus. If the root is holy, then so are the branches. If Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were Christians, which they are, then why can't their descendants also repent and become Christians too? And so Paul kind of takes a a, a lead from this language about roots and branches and, and he moves into this illustration about an olive tree. And it uses this illustration to explain what Israel really is. And how we as as Gentiles relate to our Jewish brothers and sisters in the church. And so he says, this is what Israel is really like. It's like a tree. And a tree has one trunk and one root, but many branches. But it's one tree. One trunk, one root, many branches makes one tree. It's a tree that has Jewish branches and Gentile branches, non-Jewish branches, but it's one tree with many kinds of branch. And and this is so important for us to understand because there are some who believe that Israel and the church are two completely different things. Two, uh, as as it were, two different trees in God's garden. And that leads us to one of two dangerous ideas. The first dangerous idea is that, well, if Israel Israel is one tree and, and the church is one tree, well, God's replaced Israel. He's come and he's dug up one tree, he's got rid of it, and he's stuck a new tree in his garden. That This idea that church has replaced Israel, that, he's, that God has done exactly what he said he would never do. That he's thrown out the idea of Israel, and he started with an Israel 2.0. And he's going to call them the church. As if... It, almost as if the God of the old, uh, God in the Old Testament was trying this law thing, uh, and it didn't work. So he changed his mind and he thought, "Well, I'll try this gospel thing uh, instead." And of course, if if that were true, it's not true. But if that were true, where does that leave us? Is he going to decide that the church doesn't work either? Scrap that and try Israel 3.0? No. Of course, God hasn't done that. that 
That wouldn't be faithful. That's not within his character. That's not who he is. The second error is at the other end of the spectrum, which is to say that God hasn't dumped Israel, but that the church and Israel are still two different things. To use, to mix our metaphors a little bit, it's like saying Israel was God's bride. But she wasn't very good. And she wandered off, and so God has shacked up with the church for now. And the church is really just Jesus' bit on the side while he waits for Israel to come round. That's a shocking idea. And yet I've stood face to face with a Christian and they've told me that. That's what they believe. And do you know what? It's an argument that's used that, well, if Jesus can have two wives, that's why the patriarchs had many wives. And do you know what? We can as well. At that point, I was out of the conversation. But it's mental, isn't it? It's crazy. That's not what God's like. What do we think of a man who, who did that with two wives? We wouldn't think very much of him, would we? And say, God is like that? He's not faithful in any way? But not only is that pastorally troubling to think that, well, we'll just take as many wives as we want. Again, what does that say about our relationship with God? Is he just going to cast us off when Israel comes back round again? Is he that flaky? But wonderfully, Paul assures us that is not the case. Israel and the church are not two separate people. One has not replaced the other. In fact, they are one single beautiful tree in God's garden. This tree called Israel is made up of many branches. And initially, all of these branches, as the tree grew, every single branch was Jewish. Every single branch shared Abraham's blood. Abraham, by the way, is the trunk of this tree. And, and as his family grew, so did the branches grow. But Abraham isn't the root of this tree. The life for this tree doesn't come from Abraham. Abraham himself, as the trunk, draws his life himself from Jesus. Jesus is the root of this tree. And the root in which Abraham, as the trunk, stood secure, resting on Jesus. And he draws all of his life from Jesus, from the root of Christ. And, and then he shares that life that he has with every branch that be, that's part of his family, that's part of his tree. And as his family grows, they... As they were born a part of this tree. And each member is grown out of the trunk and out of the branch. And they were a branch that all came from the same trunk and drew life from the same roots. But some of them didn't want to be part of the tree. Some of them despised the life that came from the roots. And so they were removed. Snip. The branch comes off. Esau, the first branch to be removed, followed by many others. And as this tree grew, and there were more distance from the, the trunk, it seemed as though many of the branches forgot to draw their life from the roots, and they would wither and die. And so snip, 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 the branches come off the tree. This tree that God was pruning, this tree of Israel was perhaps beginning to look bare. But this is no surprise to God. This is his plan. He is the gardener. It wasn't a mistake. He didn't have to come up with a plan B. He, it was always his intention to prune the tree of Israel in this way. Because do you know what? He didn't want a homogenous tree. He didn't want a tree where every single branch was the same. He wanted a tree that when you looked at it, what's going on there? That's full of life. Look, there's an apple there, an orange there, some cherries, and some grapes. Look at this tree. He never wanted a tree where every branch looked the same. God wanted a tree that was full of contrast and beauty and life. One that reflected the, the unity of the Trinity. And so he chose to graft in branches from these wild trees. They didn't grow from Abraham. They didn't grow in his garden. He brings them in. And he grasps them into, grafts them into the life of his son. Branches that had not originated from the trunk of Abraham, but who drew their life from the root of Jesus. And this grafting began in Egypt. Do you remember? 
through the plagues, the, the officials in Pharaoh's house who trusted in Jesus, who hearing the call, trusted that it was actually only doing what this God has said, that they would be safe. And so they respond and they bring their cattle and they bring their men in from the fields. They trusted that it was only under the blood of the Lamb that they could be safe. And so many of, Israel, many of Egypt left with Israel. They joined the people. We read in Exodus, 28, uh, sorry, Exodus 12, 38, that it was a mixed multitude that went through the Exodus, that left Egypt and were saved. Not just Israelites, but Egyptians and, and many other nations. It wasn't just Israel who were part, it wasn't just Israelites who were part of Israel anymore. And God takes these branches and he grafts them into the one tree. The one tree. It's called Israel. We, we are Israel. The family of God who draws life from the root of Jesus. This is the glory of the gospel. You can be grafted in. You may not have been born into this, but you can be grafted into it. If you trust in Jesus, if you believe with your heart, confess with your mouth that he is the only way to know God, you will be saved. He will bring you in. He is the only way to be saved. Verse 20, they were broken off. Why? Because of their unbelief. Because they didn't trust in the Messiah. They didn't trust in Jesus. But you stand fast. Why? Because you're better than them? No. Because you keep the laws better? No. Because of your faith. That's the only thing that keeps us in the tree of Christ. We trust him. We are grafted in and the spiritual life of the root surges through us. And we become part of the tree. We are filled with life and we're made to be fruitful. And so verse 26, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. All Israel will be saved. We need to understand what that's saying. Do you see? All Israel will be saved. Because Israel is that family of people who draw their life from Jesus. And if you draw your life from Jesus, you will be saved. A deliverer who has come from Zion. To say all Israel will be saved... It's not a political statement. It's not a promise to an ethnic people, to a worldly nation, but to a people of faith. We read in Galatians that the true children of Abraham are those who are his through faith. And so God is faithful to Israel, to the church, to those who trust in the Lord and who have faith in Jesus. And in that sense... God is faithful to the nation of Israel as well. Because his promise to them still stands. If you trust me, you will be saved. That was always his promise to the nation of Israel, as it is to every nation. If you trust me, if you trust in Jesus, you will be saved. This was always the offer. God's gospel is eternally the same. It's irrevocable, verse 29. The most hardened Jew, by the way, which is what Paul was, he was the most hardened Jew. Boys and girls, do you know, before, can you imagine, before Paul wrote this letter, do you know what his job was? His job was killing Christians. He hated them. Yeah, he hated them. He hated Jesus so much, he'd kill Christians. And Jesus goes, no, Paul, you're mine. You're mine? The most hardened Jew, like Paul, could be saved. They only needed to believe the same gospel as Abraham believed. The same gospel that Isaac believed. The same gospel that Jacob believed. And so, what we see so clearly is what Paul has been driving at this whole time. Israel is not made up of one race of people. And neither is any race excluded from Israel. In fact, verse 32, God has consigned all to disobedience. It's a bit depressing. Hang on. That he may have mercy on all. Do you see? All people, everyone, finds themselves under the judgment of the gospel. You have not kept the Lord's commands. But that isn't bad news. 
It's good news. Because in the same way that we come under the judgment of the gospel, we hear ourselves receiving the offer of the gospel. It means everyone finds himself under that same offer of Jesus. Trust in him. All people, irrespective of race, may find mercy through the gospel. You see, I don't know about you, but I look at the, you know, I look at the world and I'm really not going to talk about these things because I don't really know enough about them. But I see people getting angry about things like Brexit and Trump and, you know, is the sun going to burn out and are we the sea level and all this stuff. And people are getting these factions and they're trying to bring people together, but actually it's driving everyone apart. The only thing that unites humanity is the gospel. The only thing that brings us together is as we come back to the one who created us to be with him. The gospel unites humanity and it calls the world into one global community, the true Israel, the Christian church, followers of Jesus, which is given the mandate to make disciples of all nations. Israel is a world embracing reality and it always has been that's the way God always designed it to be the promise made to Abraham was that it was meant to bless all the nations of the world we have all been let down we've all been let down by people in fact I'm willing to bet we've all let people down We've gone back on our word. And even people who we have trusted the most, those who we've been closest to, even those people have hurt us and left us and broken promises to us and let us down and left us hanging. But Jesus will never do that. He's the perfect groom. He's the perfect husband. He's the perfect master. He's the perfect father. He is the one, he is the only one who we can trust with our lives. Jesus is the faithful one. He will not change his mind about you. This is a really good job, isn't it? Because his love for you doesn't depend on you, it depends on him. He loved you when you were most unlovely. And now he's picked you up and he's grafted you into his family. He will hold you fast. He will share his life with you. As long as you continue to what? Be good? No. Be moral? No. Trust in Jesus. As long as you continue to feed from the root of Christ, as long as you trust in him, you are safe. And he will never leave you or forsake you. If we've understood this gospel that Paul has been telling us about, this mission manifesto of Romans, if we've understood it at all, we are not ashamed of this gospel. This is the best news in the world. Because it is the power of God for everyone who believes. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. God has only one message for the world. One purpose for humanity. And it is faith in Jesus. Amen.